First of all, thank you, everybody. I know it's a Saturday, and to take you, uh, to bring you early Saturday morning after most likely, I hope, exciting Friday night. <laughs> I use the time when there is no computer because I remember what are the first two slides are all about. Uh, the first slide is supposed, I'm supposed to thank the association, Insurance Associ Association of Zambia. And the reason I want to thank them is because if it wasn't for them, I wouldn't be here. They are the ones that flew me over to speak to their events the past couple of days in Osaka, something relating to actuarial directly, but relating, relating to the international accounting financial standards, which is some, most of you who graduated or will be graduating, you have to put your sleep up. And this is the, the most demanding, typical work for actuaries, and I would well on that side. So the, my first thanks is for the AIZ. The second thanks for the lousy aviation industry in Africa. Because technically speaking, if there were good connections in and out countries in Africa, I would have given my speech in Lusaka on Wednesday, on Thursday morning, and I would have flown out, this is what I usually do in and out in any country, I would have flown on the same day or the second morning. The third thanks is for University of Zambia, which is hosted us, and of course for Dr. Shawa for organizing this. Last but not least, I would like to thank some employers of factories that I took the liberty to invite. Not to know me, but rather for you to know each other. I met one of your colleagues on Wednesday afternoon, just after I landed, or was it Wednesday afternoon? Yeah, Wednesday afternoon, just after I landed in, in Zambia. And I told him, why did, why did you study actual science? He said, I love math and I love money. <laughs> and he can tell you that I was very upset with him. I told him, this is something I've been fighting for for the past 20 years. Because most actuaries that I know that are 40 or 50 years old have studied actuary science because they love money. And they are lousy people. People that love money are not my servants. So, unfortunately in America, there is an index about the jobs, and they say the highest paying job is actual science. So everybody who is good in math, that loves money, goes and study to become an actual. <laughs> but not everybody that loves money is a bad guy. But usually, if this is the main reason, you can imagine that person is fixated on money. And I will be talking now about, against that, also make my case. So, this is the story that I will be talking about today. Initially, this is a small thank you introduction. Then I have three other sections that I'll be talking about. One, which is the most important section, is what is the IAA, the International Actual Association. Why you should know about it. Second, I will be talking about, <clears throat> before I talk about that, the IAA, I will be talking a little bit about me and my career path. So also I hope it will excite you. Then I'll talk about the IAA, and then I'll talk about the role of the actuary. And I will be talking about something that's going to happen in about seven months from now, in May 2023, and then what will be what we will be offering you as students for that event. So this is today's agenda, and we always in in, in classroom a teacher repeats things why for things to get instilled in your head, right? Most of what I say I will not repeat. However, 
I believe the presentation will be given to you at a later stage. So some of the things that you don't need to make notes right now, you can think about them. And I will be giving my WhatsApp and my email for people to text me or write me whatever they like. The first two, three slides that I'm going to go through right now is not really an advertisement about me or about my company. It is only to encourage you to see the guy standing by you once was like you or maybe even more disadvantaged than you. So you can have hope in the future that you stay in this career if you work in the right way it gets you. So the first thing is talking about my journey in this. I come from a family my father does not write or read. My father does not write or read. He, he drives a bulldozer. He works in a construction site. I had my sister and myself. Unfortunately, when I was only two, my uncle died. My dad's brother died. He had two children. They were older than us by three, four years. So my father said, I have four children. So he had to raise a family of four and two wives. So you can imagine a construction worker had to take care of a family of four. He worked very hard to put my cousin, who is like my brother, and myself to university. But you know what does that mean? He gave me only one year tuition. And he thought by the time I finished the one year, I should be able to figure out how I pay for the second, third, and fourth year. And since he was a construction worker, and usually parents, they want the best for their children, what did he want? He wanted me to be an engineer. Because when he was working on, on site, who is sitting in offices with air conditioning are the engineers. The blue color working are working under the rain and under the sun. So he sent me to the university to become an engineer. <coughs> Voila. I was an engineer. I got my undergraduate as an engineer. But that journey of getting work to getting my graduation, I pumped gas in gas stations, I cleaned rooms in hotels, I waited in restaurants, and I'm not going to tell you more and more what I have done to be able to pay for my university. I graduated, the war started in Lebanon. And my dad said, don't come back home. He was afraid that I'm a young guy that I would join the militia. He said, study more. By sheer accident, by sheer accident, I was at the university called the University of Michigan. It is the oldest university in America that teaches actual science. And since I'm good in math, electrical engineers are very good in math, I applied for a master's degree in actual science. So this is how my story started in the actuarial field. And you should hear my voice, the voice of my father, and my voice talking on the phone from America to Lebanon. At that time, there's no WhatsApp. To explain to my dad that I want to become an actuary. He barely knows what engineers do. You have to tell somebody 50 years ago any country like Lebanon, what an actuary is. Then he said, I trust your judgment. Will you find a job? I said, I think I'll find a job. I did not know anything about the insurance industry in Lebanon, but I knew in America, actuaries make a lot of money. So I studied and did my degree in natural science. Luckily, I met a young girl, we got married, I had a child, all this before I was 22. <laughs> <laughs> by the way, I'm a grandfather right now. My granddaughter is 17, so it's almost your age. So, now I'm a man of responsibility. It's not anymore that I do what I like. I have a wife that she's pregnant. And I didn't want to live in America. 
come conto di wife, American wife, puoi dare conto dell'altro che ci sta dentro tu, ora sei stato un I don't want my child to be born in America. So we want to have one. And we lived under the shelling for six years. During these six years, I was employed by a life insurance company in London. So I started learning what is really life insurance all about. Because as an actuary, we knew mathematics. We didn't really know what the true industry is. I remember one Christmas, maybe the second Christmas I was in Lebanon, the whole family were around the Christmas tree, and my cousin, who is older than me, was already married, was already children, but his family were in Paris. I asked them, do you have life insurance? He said, what for? He said, you know, I love you dearly, you are my elder brother. But when your father died, my dad took care of you and me, of you and your sister, and me and my sister, like a family. But we lived in a small town. It was easy, it's not that easy, but it's easy to take care of the family in the village. But now your family is in Paris. If something happened to you, I will not be able to take care of them. You should have a life insurance in case something happened to you, so your family is not indebted to me. They don't have to run to me, and I will not be able to take care of them. He said, how much should I pay? I thought, you can buy insurance for a couple hundred dollars. Well, you can go to, you to provide your family if you die. He looked at his mom. He said, go tomorrow to Church Lady of Mary. We are Catholics. Donate the church to hundred dollars. St. Mary, Lady, uh, Mother, uh, Mother Mary will take care of us. He didn't buy my insurance. He thought prayer will protect him. Now, since I work in the life insurance industry, I will put the life insurance on his life to my benefit. So if he drops that, I can cash the money. I can take care of his family. So yesterday I was going to question in the gala dinner when they were talking. I was going to challenge how many of the people present in that gala dinner have life insurance. And they are the insurance industry. I was only one year, 23 years old, I was already appreciating the importance of life insurance. Most likely, none of your parents have life insurance. Most likely. This is unawareness. This is an industry that have not educated people about the importance of life insurance. From that teaching, I decided to establish the Mohanna Foundation, and I said to myself, I want to promote students to study. Now, the Russians, they came to me to study. Well, at that time, I want to say, the ex-Soviets, they came to me to study. The Arabs, I had to go and convince them to study. Because they, why do we need to study actual science? They want to be something else. So we started the foundation, and we start teaching actual science to students. We want more, and we start teaching actual science to employers the value of actuaries and how to challenge an actual report. Because unfortunately, most senior actuaries, or sometimes not even senior, they, they write a report, they place it on the DG's office, and they think this is gospel. Take it or leave it. And this is why many, many employers they, I don't want to say they fear, they value, but I think they, I want to say the word fear, actuaries. And they think it's, it is rocket science. I was telling this lady that a brain surgeon <laughs> is, is more difficult than actuarial science. I think electrical engineering is more difficult than actuarial science. Not because there are not enough actuaries in the world that means we are brilliant, we are not brilliant. You are students. You like mathematics. None of you have invented anything. And none of you are going to really make a major change in life. Well, a half surgeon may make surgeon in life.
So this is where it is very important that we move into the education side. That will bring me now to the profession at large. How many of you have heard of the IAA? Nine out of 30 or so, not that much. Already that means you are not doing your job. Einstein was asked once, or was told once, wow, you are brilliant. He said, no, I'm merely extremely inquisitive. I'm merely extremely inquisitive. If you are not inquisitive, you won't get anywhere in life. My son started an organization to teach curiosity. Curiosity is very, very important in life. So technically speaking, if you are not curious, you won't learn anything. And this is where I say the IAA should be the initial source of knowledge. Now, the IAA is not made for individual actions. The IAA before 1995 was an association. Yeah, that's right. Good. Before 1995, it was an association of individual actions. Individual actions in the world felt like having an event every four years called Actuarial Congress, International Actuarial Congress. And the IAA at that time was an organization that organized such an event gathering of individual actions. In 1995, they realized it is not acting, it is not powerful, it's not a big lobby, it is collection actions. It should be moved to become a federation of association of actions. So by 1998, the IAA became, didn't have any more individual actuaries, it had societies and associations of actuaries who are members of the IAA. And every full member of their local society have access to the IAA. But the I, who are voting are the society, not the individuals. Okay, so I'll be talking a little bit more about the IAA, but I would like to mention when I joined the IAA in 1985, I was because I missed the first, the, the Congress legislation was supposed to take place in, 19, uh, in 18, uh, 1984. By the time I was joining 1985, I was waiting anxious for the new Congress. So the first Congress of actuaries I attended was 1988. At that time, I had just started my actuarial practice, and I remember very well over a glass of beer, I was sitting talking to other actuary, and there was the professor from Texas. Professor from Texas, he's still alive, he's a very good friend of mine, he's called Harry Panger. I was telling him, you know, I started an actuary firm, I can't find any actuaries. <laughs> At that time I was in Cyprus. He said, I remember one of my students who studied actuarial science in Austin, Texas, he always was talking about beer, his mother is in the beer business. I don't remember exactly his name, I think his name is Fish or something in Greek. So by the time I left the Congress, I went to Cyprus and start looking at that time their phone books. I don't know. I look at every family that has that name and I start calling them and made my secretary call him. Until we landed on a woman, she started interrogating us. Why are you looking for my brother? She's a lawyer. <laughs> and you are uh, over there, we say gringo, or stranger. Or... And she was very protective. I said, OK, don't give me your brother's telephone number. I, at least you know I'm an actuary. I'm looking for your brother in that capacity. Give him my number. If he is interested, let him call me. He called me. I hired him on the spot because we didn't have anybody else. Luckily, his wife was an actor. I hired his wife. And this is how we started 
our actuarial career, luckily through the networking of the IAA. If I didn't attend that Congress, I would have probably not have met this guy. So what is the IAA all about? Until 1998, when the IAA moved from being individual actuarial association to federation of association, there were only, you see you can the picture of the orange, these are the countries where there were actuaries in the world that are members of the IAA. Now, this is, I don't have updated screen, but I'll give you updated numbers. I mean, you care about the number, not the picture. But if you look, the orange became much larger, and the numbers that I will share with you right now is what we have in 2022. In 2022, we have 74 uh, associations from all over the world that are full member of the IAA, and we have 26 associations who are associate members. There's a big difference between full membership and associate membership. The full membership, not only they can vote and they pay more money to become full member of the IAA, they have the obligation that their local association have three things that are very important. Code of contact, disciplinary process, and education service. This minimum education service and code of conduct and disciplinary process will allow an association to apply to the IAA and to become from Nigeria. In Africa, although we have 50 countries in Africa, we have only six full member associations. And although we have eight member associations that are associate members, I assure you, if you see me next year, the eight, certainly some of the eight will be crossed. And maybe we hope we have other. Because some of the eights are dormant, they are not interactive, and the IAA leadership took a decision that any association who is not active within the IAA, they just want the rubber stamp saying we are a member of the IAA, we are going to cross them out. So this is, roughly speaking, about the IAA. What do you benefit or what you are at? Within the IAA, we have committees, we have working groups, we have task force. I'm very happy to tell you that I have chaired many committees, I have uh, chaired nomination committees, I've served on the council of the IAA. But what's most important thing are the sections. The sections are really the working group that is not, they're very scientific, whether life section, whether casualty section, whether investment section, and so on and so forth. And this is really where you can attend webinars, you can attend events, and you get what we call CPD credits. Because like most professional bodies right now, a lawyer that graduated in 1980, or forget about lawyers, doctors that graduated in 1980, if they don't continue studying from 1980 till now, they are obsolete doctors. Science has changed. Engineers, if they don't really study, although you think concrete is concrete, but the material has changed, the technology has changed, the needs have changed, people have to study. So one of the things about the actual profession, you graduate today, is not the end of it. It's not like, oh, I have my degree, I'm an actuary, I can work. If you don't, if you belong to an association, you cannot maintain your fellowship without having a minimum of CPD studies per year. Now, either your association provides that continuous education program, or you get it through an organization <coughs> like the IAA. The sections here, for you, I hope you know that usually, actually, they work in life industry, they work in the pension, national schemes, or healthcare, or they work in non life. So we have pension, we have a life, and we have non life, which we call casual. Until I came, I'm very proud to say that, about 25 years ago, the French actuarial profession insisted that there should be a new discipline 
New specialization within the actuary world is called investment actuary. It didn't take them very much to convince the council of the IAA yes, that this is important to have. So they introduced something called AFIR, which is really talking about investment actuary world. For banking, for central bank, for stock exchange, or for even insurance company and pension fund for ALM and so on and so forth. So I took the energy from the French and I said, we should have a health track in the actuary field. So we should have a health section. For two years, I struggled to convince the council to establish a health section. And the reason I believe in health section is it made a lot of sense to me. But it was, did not make sense to the people who are benefiting that they are doing health care and they don't belong to what I'm saying. In the past, actually they're doing health care pricing. They were looking at health care the way you look at motor pricing. Motor insurance tackles what we call high frequency, low severity claims. It's not like fire insurance, low, severity, uh, low frequency, high severity. Motor insurance, bumper to bumper, whatever it is, it is pricing. So they said, we know how to price motor, we can price healthcare. And some life actuaries, they said, this is human. This is the like mortality, we have to morbidity. We should do pricing of healthcare. I came from an angle that it is not really typical life, because it's short term with guarantees. But it's even more complex, it is similar to pension, because when people get older, their disposable income to buy health care is less, because they don't have enough pension, is usually less than their salary, and the cost is bigger. So they should start pre-funding of health care for their retirement. So this kind of concept did not exist. So we and actually that deals healthcare, whether on the private sector, whether on the national scheme, should have the vision, should have the understanding of casualty insurance, of life insurance, as well as pension. And I'm very proud to say that in 2002, we have a new section called health section. I'm coming to a conclusion on the actual side. I mentioned to you that once every four years the Congress takes place that bring actually from all over the world on primarily scientific subject matter. Now, let me go back a little bit. Among all these sections that we do, we have the life section, we have the investment section, we have the non-life section called custom, there is a section called Ayaka. This section is a commercial section. It is for international uh, consultants that are doing actuary work. Okay? So, this Congress, and I want to bring to your attention the reason I did, although here we are talking about the 23, okay, and I said, I don't know, I don't know if anybody knows these numbers, I said the Congress takes place what? Every four years. Right? So, if something's happening in 2023, how can the Tokyo take place in 2026? That's three years from now. Because the Sydney Congress was planned for 2022. But because of COVID, the organizers were afraid that we did not know in May, 20, in, during 2020, during COVID, we were not sure whether the airports were open, the visa will be granted, by 2022 people can come from all over the world, maybe Australia will close its borders from, for different countries, so it was moved to 2023. But interesting enough, in 2020, this event was planned. We are actually planning for the future. So technically speaking, 
it is not all of a sudden things change. So the speaker plan, the registration plan, so we don't decide last minute. If you go to the IAA website, you see events that are six years, seven years. If you look at my calendar, I have meetings next year, the year after, already into my calendar. This is something I would like you to bear in mind. Now, I have put something here in between. Every time there is a Congress, and many other, other than the Congresses as well, because attending Congress is very expensive exercise. Usually, and we like to encourage students to attend, we have within the IAA a committee called Advisor Assist, who I managed for many, many years. And within that committee, we have a bursary task force, which I'm the vice chair on it. So every four years, we would receive applications, 300 applications from all over the world, from people that would like to attend the Congress. And since our money is limited, we try to pick and choose to who we should give the money to. And many times, unfortunately, we make our own decisions. So we give a bursary to him, he come attend, and when he goes back, he doesn't share his knowledge with his friends or his colleagues. She attends when she comes back. So before she applies, she was planning to go become a pilot. And she doesn't tell us this in her application. She applies, she did, and then when she goes back, she goes to his pilot, her business, so money. We didn't lose the money. These people that we say professional applicants for bursary, they stole money from people that deserve to attend. So that tells you it's job for us very difficult to assess application when we give bursaries. In 2018, the Congress was in Berlin, in Germany. It was the first time we decided to have a virtual hybrid Congress, whereby people can don't have to fly in to attend the Congress, they can attend, and that was before COVID. Now it's very easy, all of us attend Zoom meetings. That was revolutionary that the Germans have did a hybrid Congress. I was in charge of the bursaries of the virtual side, of the money, but let's talk about the virtual side. I took a decision at that time that instead of giving him a bursary, I give to the university. I have to demand that the, the Congress is aired live in a classroom. The student can come in and go out. And obligation of a teacher to supervise. I will give free access to 20, 30 students. So why should I give one person to benefit? I give a whole classroom to benefit. So from this moment, I can guarantee that University of Zambia and University of Lusaka will get tickets for virtual Congress. If you go to the website, if you go to the website, virtual attendees pay money. I think the ticket is like a thousand dollars. So it's not, it's not like I'm giving something that is already free. If any of you wants to buy personal ticket, it, I think it's called thousand dollars or maybe more, I don't remember what. Two thousand dollars. So we will give ticket to the university, not only to attend, but to have access to the data, to the, to the event for at least two or three months thereafter. So there should be discussion, whether they are discussing life insurance, whether they are discussing reserving, whether they are discussing the program is very, very rich. So I wanted to tell you this, to let, we'll be communicating with the university to make sure that, and I'm concentrating in on Africa because this is where I'm the Arab world. So interesting enough, just about a week ago, not the past Sunday, the, oh, the past Sunday, I'm sorry, the past Sunday, I got a call from a fellow actually in Ireland, in Scotland. 
He knows me very well. He said, I was hiking with the Himalayas. And I had a day, extra day before my flight. And I felt like checking the actual profession in Nepal. It happened to him the way it happened to me. He met the actual profession on Saturday before he flew. During his, and he thought he is a member of the UK actual profession. He's not active in the IAA. Not necessarily every actually is active in the IAA. We, in the leadership, there are very 30, 40 people who are active in the IAA. So, technically speaking, but he knows I am active. He wrote me an email, and he said, I would like to introduce you to the president of the association in Nepal. How can we help them? I leave it up to you. So, we have a conference call with the president, with him on the line, and we have we decided to help them. I told them, give me a name of the university, they teaching, and everything so forth. So, it is not, don't feel I'm making a favor. It is commitment from me that I give to others. But when we're talking about giving, did anybody read the book The Prophet by Jibran? Start reading philosophy, psychology, history. Don't stick to math only. Jibran uh, wrote a very interesting book called The Prophet. Um, he became very famous during the 70s in America, during the happy movement where children, they were rebelling against their parents. Because in his book, he wrote a chapter about children. And he said, your children are not your children. They come through you, but not from you. You can house their bodies, but not their soul. Give them your love, but not your thoughts. Okay. The hippies at that time, they were rebelling against their family and everything. They want to do their own thing. They thought this is very appropriate for them. For me, I love the chapter about giving. In his chapter about giving, he had three levels of philosophy. The first level, he says, you give but little when you give of your possession, is when you give of yourself that you truly give. So if I give you money, it's okay. If I give you my ear or my care, that's much better. This is nice philosophy, but I'm sure each one of you subscribe to it. Each one of you could have said it. It was not really a great philosophy. He moved the, the grade a little bit higher about giving. He said, it is well to give one asked, but it is better to give unasked through understanding. So if you ask me for something and I give you, it's really nice. But if I feel your need, and I give you without being degraded to ask. This is lovely. So this is something I subscribe to. I try to understand people's needs and not wait for them to ask, but for me to be proactive and give them. Now the third level, that the philosophy that I think is sublime. Somebody told the prophet, I shall give, but only to the deserving. What would you say to somebody that will tell you, I'll give it, but only to deserve it? Most people I ask this question to, they are not silent like you. They usually speak. And the response usually I get, how do you know who deserves? To grant it, the prophet didn't say that. He said, ask yourself, do you deserve to be a giver? The tree in your orchard say not so, it gives so it may live, because to withhold is to perish. All what you have, one day shall be given. So give now, let the season of giving be yours, not your inheritors. Let the season of giving be yours, not your inheritors. This is the right giving. So, whether he deserves or not, that's irrelevant. If I have the fruits, I must deserve. I should give, otherwise I'm dead. A tree that does not give is dead. A sign of being alive is giving. So giving, whether you give your ear or give material, 
is giving, so be a giver. So, we all hear about actual qualification. A carpenter studying vocational work as a carpenter is a carpenter. A barber is a barber. A smith is a smith. With due respect to all other professions. You guys, you studied actual science. You call yourself actual science. But the thing that is not what you call yourself, it is what the person that is using you accepts that title that you call yourself with. So the profession have made categories of actuaries. They have student actuaries, they have analyst actuaries, they have associate actuaries, they have fellowship actuaries. Insurance regulators in many, many jurisdictions in the world, with due respect, universities, they are unable to assess the level of graduates from a university. So they depend on certain independent qualification, and this is why, as a signing actuary, many jurisdictions, especially developing world, would say, okay, we will only accept a qualified actuary that is a full member, associate member, from a full member association of the IAA. So, as I said, we have 70 odd associations who are members of the IAA. All their members who are full members of that association are recognized as full members. Some jurisdictions, they, they go a little bit further. They don't say we accept a full member, a fellow of a full member association. They say we want a fellow of the Institute of Actuary, Institute and Faculty of the UK or we want a fellow of the Society of Action, or we want a fellow from South Africa. We don't want, we don't understand the Belge, we don't understand the German, we don't understand the Lebanese, we don't understand the Swiss. We want this, we are Anglo-Saxon countries. We relate to these big organizations. I disagree, but does that make a difference? Regulators have subscribed to that thing, and I've said it in public, that big organization have a colonial concept that they control the education in these countries and they come and they promote that we are the fellows, the people in Lusaka graduating are not good enough for you. So unfortunately, you have to, if you are going to be a signing actuary, not working actuary technician, but a signing actuary, I will, I will say what a signing actuary in a minute. You have to, in Lusak, in Zambia, you have to be a fellow of the Institute of Actuary or the, uh, a member of the uh, Society of Actuary Fellow of the Society and so on and so forth. Having said that, besides that the exams are very difficult, they are costly. And many students, when they are studying, they don't have money for these exams. I'm very proud to say we as Mohana Foundation decided to pay 50% of the cost of your exams, to urge you to take exams, and to encourage you to at least pass one or two exams while you are still at the university. And once you graduate, your first year of employment, we will pay 50% of your exam, no matter which organization you are working for. If your organization pays full, it's fine. The money goes to somebody else. So this is something very important, that qualification is very important in actual science. That does not mean that this is, if you are not qualified actually, it means you are not an actual. You can do actual work, but you cannot sign a reserve of a life insurance company, and certainly you cannot sign a valuation of a, a social security fund. So these are very important things that you have to know. The profession have regulated itself by saying who can sign and who cannot sign. Having said that, to become a qualified actuary is not only taking actuarial courses. There is a very important course which is called professionalism. How to act as a professional when you are as an actuary. When can you say no to your employer or to your client? Not because he pays his salary, he can dictate what this contract you use. If you are convinced of what you are using, you stand your feet, you either resign or you blow the whistle 
or what you have a proper public uh, interest obligation. You cannot just be for the money. So qualified actually have a professional obligation to do so. You did a mistake in your work. Everybody does a mistake. You discovered the mistake your own a year later. What is your obligation in correcting the mistake and disclosing the mistake to your client? Somebody else, you found the mistake of somebody else. What is your obligation? What to do? This course of professionalism you have to take before you become a qualified action. So a qualified action is not only a mathematician. It is a profession that we put together. And since small organizations like the Society of Actuary of the Zambia is too small, who is going to tell the other member you are wrong, you are good or you are bad? We as IAA tell the small association when they want to become fellow, a full member association of the IAA, that they should have in their disciplinary process independent actuaries, honorary members from the international world, serve on their, because if she does a mistake, the other fellow member is her colleague, is her friend. Who is going to tell her you made it? Who is going to discipline her work? So any organization that is small, if it dreams to become a full member association of the IAA, they should have in place a proper code of conduct, a proper disciplinary process. And the only way they can have a disciplinary <coughs> process is to have independent people that are other members of that association and their job, if, if there is a disciplinary issue, to serve for the benefit of the profession. So this is something very important I want to say. I mentioned the word public interest. I assure you, only an actuary that has a long vision, supposedly, should think of public interest. I do work for governments that my results may not be seen for 20, 30 years. I cannot just please a management to say this minister is happy with the results today and then I can bankrupt a country in my work. I have to think of the pub public interest. I cannot sign on a life insurance product that is not good. No matter how much they pay. I have told kings that they are wrong. I have told presidents that they are wrong. And I walk away. I will not sign on something, in my opinion, is wrong against public interest. This is something very important. You will work for insurance companies and you will be forced and pressured by general managers to lower the reserve because he wants to make the company profitable because his bonus is linked to the profitability of the company. If you are convinced your work is right, you stick to your work. If they don't like you, you resign. This is professionalism. So this is something that you have to bear in mind on the tour. Now, the role of the actuary, just mentioned only the insurance industry. But you can work in so many industries. You think of pension, you can work beyond. You know that electricity authority needs actuaries. Telecom companies need actuaries. Actuaries are ideal individuals to handle data and analyze risk. So you should never worry about problems when you job. It's only how you present yourself and where you want to go. So the role of the actuary is very important in the economy at large. Teaching. That some of you may want to be a teacher. That's a great job. That's a great job. It is. You can imagine when you are driving from the hotel here, how happy you are telling me about this student who has, is here this way, he succeeded that way. Teacher, that is the pleasure, seeing you guys succeed. So it is very important to me that uh, recognition. Finally, I did mention about uh, the actuary, and uh, here I've highlighted in very important two things, that they are social mathematicians. They are not mathematicians. We have to understand really the social fabric when we are 
doing actual, actual work. It's not only probability, statistics. Uh, I was, uh, I heard, uh, uh, operation research, I think it should be mandatory, it should be mandatory in the curriculum of actual science. Many universities don't have it, they have as elective, not in the core system. Students can choose it or not. So I urge the academia to encourage students to take operation research. What is operation research? It's a science. The word operation comes from military operation. The father of the science of operation research is somebody called W.E. Deming, who passed away a few years ago. During World War II, W.E. Deming, a statistician, he realized that the war was the brinks of being lost again by the West. But they have all the capacity, capability of winning. So he asked a few questions. He asked, this airplane, I don't know the numbers now, but let's, let's, let's assume the number. How many bombs it takes? He said, 100, 100 bombs. How many sides does it go and shell? They say, three sides. We drop 30 of bombs on every side. His question is, how many bombs is needed to destroy the site you need. But three, four. But we drop 30 to make sure we cover, we, we, we destroy everything. Plus, not all the 100 that will explode. Usually 10, 20 percent are defective. And the people that they gave us the target, they may not be within meters. They may be not accurate. So we destroy the whole area. Plus, the instrument of the airplane may not be accurate. So there is many faults everywhere. So we carry 100 build bombs and we destroy three sides. He went and started working backwards. The, th the easy thing to do is to start fixing the error of the instruments. The instrument should work. It can, should not be faulty. This is one. Second thing, he start working on the manufacturing of the bomb. Why should it have 20% default? Maybe it should have zero, maybe it should have 5%. So most of the bombs should uh, explode. Now the, the third one was very difficult because the guy that's giving the target taste is human. I mean, people have a human error. So he said, let's forget about that. Let's start concentrating on this. By concentrating on this, he minimized the need of dropping 30 to only dropping 10. Still more than 3-4 needed, they need 3-4 to explode, but he brought down to 10. What does that mean? So the plane that goes in the air can bomb what? 10 sides, not 3 sides. So every aircraft that went out, it tripled its effect. So they didn't need to put 50 airplanes in the air and having chance of being shut down, he was able to put only 5 airplanes in the air and do the same job. So this is operation research and he became the success. This guy, the concept of zero error. He was discovered in Japan and then the Japanese took him after World War II and they said, we don't want to discuss military, we want to discuss zero error in industry in Toyota, in Nissan, and so on and so forth. So we as actuaries, we should have the concept of zero error. Among the things that I didn't tell you I have, I used to own a life insurance company. And my, my company that I had, it only insured pilots. And this is why I enjoy reading about pilots. Or I have the company because I like pilots. I don't know which one comes first. <laughs> Anyway, one of my staff was the first pilot to fly the Concorde across the Atlantic. When it was still a test, he was still a test pilot. And he used to tell me, in aviation, any error could be fatal. So a plane that takes off, the pilot has to feel that there should be zero error from the guy that put air in the tires from the, everybody. 
Zero error. The air traffic, air traffic controller, any error could be fatal. So we ran the company because he was the big player in our company. We ran the company as a zero error. Zero error. We didn't accept a secretary to make a mistake. We didn't accept a receptionist to make a mistake. No mistakes were allowed in the company. And this is why I made a lot of money, because I sold it as a perfect company. Zero error. So in industry, if you take operation research and put it in the commercial side, it could be very beneficial. Our colleagues here in the insurance industry really don't love you guys. They have to have you, but they don't love you. Actually, it has been viewed as a tax. We have to have them. The way they view auditors, no added value. No added value. They only, the, the true value in a company is the underwriter, because he is underwriting the risk. The claim manager, because he is the face of the company, the reputation of the company, and the market to bring the business. Everybody else is, you know, not value added whatsoever. The only way you can be value added is if you become creative. Whereby you work with them, you work with the marketing people, and you understand the financial position of the company. In, Tanzania, in uh, Zambia, the past few days, I've spoken to many insurance companies. If I was the regulator, I would close half of them down. Not because they are not highly capitalized, because the management have no idea what they're talking about. <laughs> I have no idea. I'm talking about, I spoke to DGs or companies and reinsurance companies. I won't hire them. They have to work very hard to bring up the knowledge, the true knowledge of insurance. They think like a I said it in public. Did I say or not? That most of you are brokers. So they're insurance companies. They're not insurance companies. They have no risk appetite. And now they are telling me they want to increase their attention because of. Oh, we have, we don't want to give reinsurance money. They barely, they barely can handle the risk they have. So this is something very important. You are the people of the future. You, with due respect to a claim manager, with due respect to accountant, you should understand risk. You are taught to analyze risk. You are taught to put the price on the future. I will end up with two stories of actuals. There was a fire, a major fire, and a policy should be issued before the fact. How can you sell a fire policy, a liability policy, after the claim took place? This actual was very right. He said, this, public, this incident will have claims coming through. They will not come through altogether. The court system will not be paying them all together. And the award, we don't know how much the award, the liability, the court will award. So I will sell you reinsurance package on top of what you have in, pack in, in uh, packages. If you buy another half a million dollars, or I don't remember the number, it costs you, that half a million, it will cost you 450 million in premium. Because it is almost certain that you are going to pay it, but you don't know when. So while he was playing on the discount rate, the second half a million, 500,000, uh, I'll sell it to you at 400,000, after the first million is paid. Now we have two things, probability of event and discount rate. So this is a serious action. To think about the last example of an action, the right action. I don't know if this is in Zambia, people do that. In the UK, there is this lotto. Lottery, people buy lotto. Huh? Yeah. So, what is common in the UK, that staff among each other, they go and buy 10, 15 tickets, so they can maximize each one's probability of winning. And when they win, they, they share the prize. 
What happened? Uh, one company, things happened, 10 people in one department, not insurance department, in department store or whatever, they won. They resigned. They are all low salary staff anyway. They won a lot of money. They said, well, we'll go on holidays. We'll get a job when we come back. Now, the department store didn't make a big difference because a big organization. This actually was smart. Because it was in the newspaper that there were 10 people resigned at the same time. He thought, what if a small company, their staff bought the ticket? And the small company, 10 of their 15 people resigned at the same time. The company would collapse. He went and made an insurance policy whereby a company can buy insurance on, their staff, on themselves their staff first win, second resign. If they win and don't resign, they don't have a problem. And if they resign and don't win, this is not the policy. And he created a policy and the premium was negligible. They didn't wait for GIZ to come and pay money to create products. It was an individual that created the product. The reason I say that because one of the speakers on uh, of yesterday's meeting said, oh, we will have donors to help us create the, uh, the insurance industry. You don't need donors, you need brains. <laughs> so I will expect you, you guys read, and don't only read actuary work. I told you, read philosophy, read history, read many things that brought into your mind. And then you become creative and you learn from others. Thank you very much, and I wish you all the best.